In the last chapter, we introduced the Coulomb's law and the idea of electric field. And we apply them to calculate the electric fields due to various extended charge distributions, um, which was a lot, as you can see on the screen here. Now, I want to step back for a bit and consider the nature and character of some of the physical laws that we have seen so far, and along the way, introduce a new law that you will see this week, Gauss's Law. Uh, so let me give this a title, Introduction to Gauss's Law. And we are going to talk about something called the electric flux. Coulomb's Law is what we call an inverse square law. Square, because the strength of the electric field depends on the distance squared, and inverse, because as the distance increases, the electric field strength decreases. That is, the electric field strength is proportional to 1 over r squared. And for most of you, this is not the first time you have seen an inverse square law. When you learned Newton's law of universal gravitation, there was another inverse square law. Gravitational force due to a point mass is proportional to 1 over r squared. In fact, inverse square laws are incredibly common. In particle physics, whenever we have a force or a field that decreases as 1 over r squared, inverse square law, we call that a long range force. So that has to make you wonder, is there some physical significance to that 1 over r squared relationship uh, in a way there wouldn't be for a 1 over r or 1 over r cubed relationship. We can look at another phenomenon that has a kind of inverse square law. We haven't officially looked at it before, but I think it's intuitive enough for people to just to think through. Imagine that you have a 60 watt light bulb in the middle of a big empty space. Every second it's on, it emits 60 joule of energy in the form of light, visible and infrared. Consider how bright this light bulb would appear one meter away and compare it to its brightness, for example, two meters away. We measure intensity, one of the ways to measure brightness, as amount of power going through some area per area. If the 60 watt of radiative power is going through 10 square meters, for example, then the intensity would be 6 watt per meter squared. With uh, nothing more than a couple basic principles, like a conservation of energy and the geometry of three-dimensional space, you can figure out how the intensity of this light bulb should change with the distance. Consider some volume containing the light bulb. If energy is conserved in the space the light bulb is in, then an equal amount of energy should leave the space each second as radiative energy enters through the light bulb. Each second the light bulb emits 60 joule of energy. This energy should leave the volume containing the light bulb each second. And this statement would be true for any volume. So we could consider a sphere of radius 1. Or we could consider a sphere of 2 meter radius, but let's stick to 1 meter for now. Finding the intensity of the light bulb at this distance is as simple as taking the total power of the light bulb, 60 watts, and dividing by the surface area of the sphere having radius r. That would be 4 pi r squared for the surface area of a sphere. This would be r. 1 meter or r. This is assuming that the light bulb emits light omnidirectionally. Now, if you are looking at the intensity at 2 meters away, since the surface area of a sphere of radius 2 meters is 4 times the surface area of a sphere with a radius of 1 meter, from surface area 4 pi 1 meter squared, comparing that with a 4 pi 2 meter squared, the intensity at 2 meters away is 1 over 2 square times intensity at 1 meter away. In other words, this intensity obeys a kind of inverse square law. 
following from this dependence of the area that the radiative power would go through. Note the simplicity of this argument. It doesn't depend on some complex details of how light travels. It only depends on a conservation law. Once the radiative energy enters the volume through a source, the light bulb, it has to leave the volume somehow. It can't simply disappear. That the intensity of light should follow an inverse square law is a natural consequence of our three-dimensional universe. Can electric fields be thought of in a similar way? The following is the line of thinking you might go through. Think about the electric field lines you learn to draw. If you have a positive charge somewhere, we draw these lines as coming out of that positive charge. And these lines go on forever. One of the rules that we have for drawing electric field lines is that the field lines begin on a positive charge and end on a negative charge. If you don't have any negative charges, then you can end these lines. They have to go out to infinity. We could almost say electric field lines are conserved. We don't quite say that. Uh, but in any case, electric field lines can just disappear. And if you have some positive charges in some space and you count, say, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 electric field lines coming out of it, whether you count them going through a small volume or a large volume, you are going to count the same eight lines. How will this help us come up with a new law? We can think in analogies. Imagine that the positive charge is like a light bulb, and the electric field lines are like rays of light coming from the light bulb. The strength of the electric field is indicated by how densely packed the electric field lines are, and the intensity of light is indicated by how densely packed the light rays are. In the example with the light, the intensity itself wasn't conserved. It followed the inverse square law. But the power was. The same 60 watt of power had to leave the volume regardless of its size. So with the electric field, while the electric field itself isn't conserved, it follows the inverse square law. A quantity we can associate with the electric field times area might be conserved in a way similar to how we always count eight field lines for a positive charge, regardless of the volume we use. We do define a quantity that is a kind of electric field times an area, and we call it flux. And because we don't have the same intuition we have for this flux that we have for radiative power going through an area, we have to be careful. Let me give this a simplified example. Let's say we have uniform beam of light, and we have these two square areas, one oriented this way and another oriented this way. Does the same amount of radiative power flow through these square areas? I think most of us intuitively know that the answer is no. In fact, if we turn this square surface so that the light rays are going parallel to the surface, we can see that no light is going through the surface. So when we say power is intensity times area, it's not a multiplication between two scalars. In fact, it has to be a multiplication between two vectors, maybe a dot product. Going back to flux being electric field times area, we already introduced the electric field as a vector, and we can use it as it is. But how is area a vector? Or more precisely, we can see that when we have a surface area, we can see that something is physically changing when you rotate it. You can see that like, orientation of surface in space has a meaning. But how do we express that mathematically? If you are thinking of a vector that is in the plane, no single vector will do the job. When I talked about light rays going parallel to the surface, I think we were intuitively thinking of a vector that is in the plane and that is parallel to the light rays. 
but there are also vectors tangent to the surface going this way that is in the surface but it's perpendicular to the direction of the light rays and if we accidentally pick one of these vectors we'll have a very wrong idea about how the surface is oriented relative to the light rays and we have the same problem when we are considering the electric field times area what will in fact work is a vector that's perpendicular to the surface. So on, with a surface like this, I would be looking at vector that's a perpendicular. And as I imagine uh, rotating the surface, the vector would remain perpendicular to the surface and uh, stay that way. By the way, depending on your physics 4A class, this discussion might have been covered when they cover the cross product, which physics 4A uses to handle the rotation of rigid bodies. The set of all lines that are perpendicular to a particular given vector, it, it defines a surface oriented in a particular way. Um, here in this picture, it would be this surface that's a perpendicular to this given vector. And we call this given vector surface normal. Normal here just means perpendicular. It's a bit of a peculiar usage of terms. So when I talked about light rays going parallel to the surface, if I wanted to make that mathematically precise and not rely on your intuitive mental picture for the situation, I would instead say light rays going perpendicular to the surface normal. And there's an elegant simplicity here. If I define radiative power going through some surface as intensity, dot product with some area, where the direction of the intensity vector is in the direction of the propagation direction of light, and direction of the surface vector is in the direction of the surface normal. In the situation where the surface is perpendicular to the light, so we get the maximum power going through, the I dot A will be a maximum because they are parallel. And in this situation, where the surface is parallel to the direction of the light rays, the dot product I dot A will be zero because they are perpendicular. So this precise mathematical description gives physically reasonable results. So electric flux through a surface is defined similarly as electric field dot product with the surface vector flux V is equal to E dot A. Let's practice using this definition of flux with a few simple geometries. We know a point charge produces radially outgoing field lines. Let's pick a distance R at which point we measure electric field E as a function of R. And if we put together the set of all points that are at distance R, that becomes a sphere of radius r. Let me try to draw this sphere here. What is the electric flux through this spherical surface of radius r? If we simply did flux is equal to electric field times area and did phi is equal to electric field e times 4 pi r squared. 4 pi r squared that being the surface area of a sphere. Well, that is the correct answer. Um, but we might miss some subtleties that's important elsewhere. So let's be careful from the start. When you go from one part of sphere to another part of sphere, a lot changes. The direction of surface normal vector changes for one. So Instead of writing down the electric field dot product with the surface area for the whole sphere, what we can do instead is write it down for a representative surface element of an infinitesimal size, dA. Then for this surface element, we can look at the surface normal vector and see that it points in the same direction as the electric field vector, radially outward and work out the expression E dot dA. It's just the E dA. Because the two vectors are parallel, the dot product just becomes the product of the 
magnitudes of the two vectors. And the vector cosine theta that would be there, that's just one because theta is zero. Now, imagine doing this for every surface area element that covers the whole sphere. It's a lot, so I'm not going to draw them all. But doing that is what gives us the integral over the sphere of E dA. And that should be the total flux. Now, here's the magical part. Because we are on the surface of the sphere, which is all at distance r from the point charge, the electric field strength E is the same everywhere on the sphere. Meaning it's a constant, we can pull it out of the integral. This integral just becomes E times integral of dA over the sphere. And we already did the dot product, so these are both just the scalars now. And we already know this integral. That's the surface area of a sphere. So that's a 4 pi r squared. Make sure to multiply to the coefficient e for the flux. So the electric flux through the spherical surface in this example is uh, e times the 4 pi r squared. e times 4 pi r squared. As I said, it, it is the correct answer, but I want you to go through this reasoning process. Now, let's cover a slightly more complicated example. We'll keep the point charge the same. Let me draw the field lines. And instead of a spherical surface, let's imagine a cube of side L. And if we want, we can make this L equal to 2R to make the situations above and here now comparable. And it's the same question. What is the electric flux? And if anyone's thinking, that's a simple. Each face is at distance r from the charge. And the area here is L squared. So the flux through each face is E, same E as above, times L squared. You got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, the front, 6, the back faces. So the total flux is e times 6L squared, or in terms of R, since L is equal to 2R, e times 2R squared, 4R squared, uh, 4 times 6, 24, 24R squared. And that's the answer. No, that's not the answer. This is why we went through the first example with some care. Let's uh, look at some representative surface area elements on the cubic surface. I'll use this uh, top surface for examples. When I did uh, this calculation, I was thinking of this surface area element right at the center of a face. It's a distance r away from the positive charge, and the surface normal is pointing radially away from the charge. But this face has other surface area elements, like this one near the corner. This is not distance r away. This should be, I think, a square root of 3r away. And the direction of the surface normal vector and the direction that's radial, they are no longer parallel. This angle isn't zero anymore. And the dot product, e dot dA, is no longer very simple. And this will depend on where on the face you are. Now we could go through a corrected, detailed calculation, fixing these issues, maybe. <laughs> but le let's step back and compare this picture of the electric flux through a cubic surface with this picture of the electric flux through a spherical surface. For the sphere, we calculated e times 4 pi r squared for the flux. Should it be different for the cube? Both the surfaces have the same number of electric field lines going through them. 8 here and 8 here. This is the kind of conservation law that we are talking about. Intuitively, I think the electric flux through this uh, cubic surface should be the same as the flux through this spherical surface. Because once these electric field lines are sourced through the positive charge, 
It has nowhere to go except through a surface enclosing the charge. And so on. And similarly, if this spherical surface area was a small or large, it shouldn't affect the flux we would calculate. The electric flux we calculated before might make it look like the flux depends on radius r because the flux is equal to e times 4 pi r squared. But this electric field e is a function of distance r. According to Coulomb's law, e is equal to Coulomb constant times q, the amount of charge, divided by r squared. Plugging this into the flux, we can see that the r squared in the denominator canceling out with the r squared in the numerator, that the total flux through the spherical surface is equal to, let me rearrange the terms a little bit, q times 4 pi times Coulomb constant. Uh, your textbook and many other textbooks define a new constant called permittivity of free space or um, electric constant or uh, written as epsilon naught that is equal to 1 over 4 pi times Coulomb's constant now, to write this quantity as q over epsilon naught. These are the simplified expressions for the flux, and the R dependence is gone. Now, let's formalize this intuition. We used examples of spherical and cubic surfaces. But if our intuition about conservation of electric field lines is right, the result shouldn't depend on any particular shape of the surface. The only thing we should need to know to calculate the total electric flux out of a volume is how many sources of electric fields, the positive charges, are inside the volume, minus the sinks for electric fields, negative charges, where the field lines can end without exiting the volume. This gives us Gauss's law, the electric flux out of a volume or the closed surface integral of e dot dA is equal to what we calculated using the example of the spherical surface. Charge enclosed times 4 pi Coulomb constant. Or if we are most textbook authors, charge enclosed divided by epsilon naught or permittivity of free space or electric constant. It's a highly abstract, highly mathematical law. So I want you to do it some justice introducing it properly. We are going to spend some time applying the Gauss's law to driving electric field formulas in other lectures. What I want you to keep in mind are, one, whenever we are applying Gauss's law, what we are secretly interested in are the electric fields, not the flux. In fact, there aren't that many applications of electric flux other than in stating Gauss's law in its integral form. Two, symmetry, symmetry, symmetry. The derivation of electric fields applying Gauss's laws looks almost like magic. You see a few right words and you're done. The process that makes this amazing simplification also mathematically rigorous is the argument appealing to symmetry. And especially for those of you who may become a physicist, you know, go to physics grad school and all that, these symmetry arguments are well worth paying attention to. I think that's all. Thank you for watching this long lecture to the end. And see you in the application of Gauss's Law lectures.